Get ready. NHL Sense Arena 25 has just arrived. Dive into the new 2025 NHL season with the Utah Hockey Club and new scoring system. Earn experience points and benefit from our new training in-app guidance. A brand new trophy room for your achievements. And our coolest new feature hitting the ice this November. NHL Sense Arena 25. Train smarter, play faster. And gang, remember, you get $50 off an annual subscription at NHL Sense Arena when you use the code Hockey Never Stops at hockey.sensearena.com. Again, $50 off an annual subscription at hockey.sensearena.com when you use Hockey Never Stops. Let's get you into your episode on the Outer Kids Play Hockey Network. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another episode of our newest series, Our Girls Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and I'm joined by Mike Benelli and Sherry Hudspeth. And remember, our goal with this show is to tackle the topics and discussions surrounding youth girls hockey to better the game for everybody. And if you're involved in youth hockey in any way, we're going to provide value and insight to create both a better environment and experience for everyone involved. For this episode, our topic is girls hockey versus boys hockey. Sounds like a Marvel film, but what's the difference? And our expert panelist is Kim McCullough, the director of Total Female Hockey. Kim played six seasons of pro hockey and was also the captain and leading scorer at Dartmouth College, graduating in 2002. She is a highly sought after coach, a mother of three, and we are fortunate to have her on today. Kim, welcome to Our Girls Play Hockey. Thanks so much, Lee, and I've listened to all the episodes so far that you guys have done uh, specifically on the girls, and I think it's awesome that you're uh, going down this track, so thanks for having me. Well, hey, listen, the honor's all ours. I mean, when we do shows like this and the Our Kids Play Hockey Network, uh, one of the things we were really driven to do was find kind of the conversational gaps in the game, Um, and when we spoke with Sherry, I think we realized that, hey, look, there's an opportunity here to do a, a show that's going to serve the girls game, but really the, the broader game in its entire sense. And great guests such as yourself are really what make that drive. So thank you for being here again. It means a lot to us. <laughs> so well, my our- pleasure. I was on the ice for uh, 32 hours in the last uh, four days. So yeah, hopefully this uh, voice uh, holds up at the end of hockey camp season. So luckily for you, everyone on this call could probably say that. And, and, <laughs> I'm serious. The amount of ice time I've logged this week. Uh, I feel fit, but I'm feeling pretty tired. All right. I'm not going to lie to you. So listen, with our topic today, I want everybody to know if you heard our episode we did a few weeks ago uh, when we discussed when it may or may not be the right time to move from boys uh, hockey to a girls hockey program. This is kind of a a companion to that or part two of that uh, in the way we formatted the question. So uh, we're going to start really broad here, Kim. Let me ask you this this off the top of the bat. What do you think is the biggest difference between girls and boys hockey? Well, I think there's a few. I think the the biggest one, and it certainly pops at young ages, is the social piece. Um, you know, there's something to be said of being around a whole bunch of other girls versus boys. And, you know, I'm based out of Toronto, so there's no shortage of hockey options for everyone from boys to girls to co-ed. And, you know, you, you can barely drive 10 minutes without uh, running into another competitive center. So um, there's no question that <laughs> the opportunities are there. Um, I would say the social piece is big, and I don't mean like the parties, although I'm sure the parties are different too. Um, but just being with your peers and being able to um, have that personal connection in that way, I think is a really big driver. And, and sometimes one of the big reasons that people switch um certainly at the young ages i don't think there's any difference in terms of skill level or the things we should be teaching them um you know i would coach i run total female hockey but i could i would coach boys the exact same way right. uh, the marketing's different with the ponytail on the hat but other than that <laughs> uh, it would be identical um so i don't think there's much that way and then certainly uh, you do get the difference uh when the checking comes in uh the physicality um now that said i teach my players physicality from the time they're six so we are you know definitely a tough team and could definitely hang in with a bunch of young boys uh but we we don't get to the checking piece um i guess now until the pwhl i know you guys talked about that on a previous episode um but uh i would say other than that 
Um, the level of hockey craziness here in Toronto is comparable with the two. Unfortunately, we're not making uh, Connor McDavid money anytime soon. So that's obviously a difference. Although I will say Poulin deserves that kind of money. And I would love mm -hmm. to see her get paid that one day. Um, but I would say one of the biggest things I hear from parents, you know, if they start their girls and boys and then they come to our camps, which are all girls, or they move to girls hockey, it's just that their daughter's personality is different. And mm -hmm. she kind of opens up a little bit uh, when she comes to the girls game. And that's, you know, that's different for everyone. Uh, obviously, there's girls who love being around the boys and being in that environment and works well for them. Um, but just in my experience, that's the feedback I get from parents who maybe have had experience in the boys game and then bring their girls over to the girls game. Kim, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for all you're doing for the women's game. It's very inspiring, and especially your camps that have all female coaches. Um, we're going to dive into that in a little bit. But statistically, there's still a higher population of boys that play over girls. Can you talk about what challenges that creates and how do we get more women involved in coaching? Oh, well, I'm trying my best, Sherry, to get as many <laughs> of my former teammates and friends. I think one of the challenges with women in coaching is, you know, sort of the off ramp um, when, kin when kids come into play, if kids or relationships come to play. Um, so certainly we see in Toronto a lot of uh, women who want to get back after they played college hockey or they played, you know, at a competitive level and they want to get back involved with the game. Um, typically they want to get back involved in the game at the top level, which can be challenging because they don't necessarily have coaching experience, but certainly it's a bit of a cachet to have a pro player or a D1, D3, whatever it is, you sports player come in and coach your U15 AA or U18 AA team. Um, so that's typically where they get on the ramp, which is an interesting um, transition because they're not necessarily that experienced in the running of a hockey team, uh, although they've come up from high level hockey. So their drills and their skills are quite good. Um, and then, you know, typically there's an off ramping either. Hey, like, I don't want to spend 24 seven all my weekends and evenings in a rink anymore, or I'm in a relationship and we're going to have kids. And so we get off the ramp and then do we get back on the ramp afterwards? I really believe, and I I don't know, I must be a unicorn. I might be one of the few women who actually coached through having kids. I went into labor with my second kid on the bench during a game. So, um, but I didn't whoa, whoa, leave. Whoa, whoa. You got to tell that story. Whoa. Oh, we can go that's... into that if you want. <laughs> Anyways, I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, Please I think do, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a big challenge. Um, you know, a hurdle. I, I don't want to call my children a hurdle, but... Some mornings they're a hurdle. Um, we all relate to that. Don't worry. <laughs> but um, I'll tell the, okay, let's tell that story. Wait, wait, wait. So, I just want to say to the audience listening here, um, I've never experienced this. Mike's never experienced this. All right. This is something uh, new. The game always surprises you. Uh, just to recoup, uh, recap here, I believe you said you went into labor on the bench with one of your children. Okay. I, I just wanted to set that up again for myself because you said that and I was like, did I hear that correctly? Uh, Kim, the floor is yours. Yeah, this is a good one. So so this is my second child. So those of you who are listening who have had children, this would have been very different if it was my first child. But this was my second child. So I knew very well the feelings you feel when you go into labor and that you don't need to panic and go to the hospital right away. Although, again, my my three labors were quite easy. So this has got like disclaimers all over it. Um, so we're in a we're in the provincials. Uh this would have been when I was coaching U22 Elite. Uh, we're playing, I think it was an Apian. I was coaching with Lee Side. I've been coaching with Lee Side forever. And it's a, like a banger of a game, like up and back, up and back, like a track meet. Goalies are playing great. Players are playing great. I think we're both like top five teams in the league at that point. It's a great, you know, it's one of those games as a coach you almost never get where you just cross your arms and lean against the wall. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. bad to say. Like, it's just a, just enjoying a great the game. game. Yeah. <laughs> so after the first period, I'm like, oh, it's not feeling great. Now, at that point in your pregnancy, you're never feeling great. But definitely it was like something's going on here. But you know, classic hockey player. I'm like, we're just going to keep her going here. Um, you know, I had the flood between the second and the third. Didn't say anything to anybody. It was OK. I was just leaning against the wall, you know. And then uh, so we end up. I don't even remember what the score of the game is now, because obviously I was preoccupied. But this would have been the first day at Provincials. I go into the dressing room after, and I'm like, hey, girls, like this, you know, it's a great game, and here's what we need to do. And, you know, classic coach debrief. 
And uh, as I'm leaving the rink, uh, my my dad used to come and watch all the games I coached, which is awesome. And then uh, my husband was there. And uh, we're walking at the door. I'm like saying bye to everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye. Like, Good day. See you. And then like we get right out the door and I'm like, we need to go to the hospital. <laughs> it's probably happening now. So, and they're like, no react. They're like, okay. Like, wow. Classic me. So, and anyways, we went to the hospital and a couple hours later, I text my assistant coaches and I'm like, Hey, you guys are in charge tomorrow. And they're like, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. And, um, my daughter was, was born the next day and I missed the games and I got updates from everybody. Um, but that's as Kim a story as you're going to get. Cause that tracks wow. 100%. That that's um, not a Kim story. That's a hockey story. That is, that is story. something with your permission. We're definitely going to share that one because that's one I've never heard before. Now, now remind me, you said this was your second kid. That was my second. Yeah. And, and your second plays or, or and doesn't she play. plays and she, she skates plays. like the wind. All right. Yeah. When she, when she makes the PWHL, we're going to share this clip again because this is the real origin story of <laughs> of how that happened. Yeah, it was. She was born for it, and every year, like her birthday lands around provincials, right? Which is right. great when you're a young hockey player. And uh, yeah, then the 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 third one, I had her actually in between playoff series, so that I could get back. I was on the bench when she was two days old yeah you timed that one <laughs> yeah that one was like well we tried to time that one as we much tried as to time that one. things wow. yeah so the difference between girls yeah. hockey and boys hockey we've just discovered it uh women are willing to go into labor on the bench and no man in the history of hockey has ever done that just making you guys i'm in awe <laughs> that's amazing all right listen we got to get back <laughs> on track but you said that i said whoa 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 we gotta we gotta hear this story go ahead mike sorry good one yeah, I slammed my finger in the door once and I had to go to the hospital uh, after a game. And but he uh, stuck it out. I'll tell, I'll tell my out. story. I did I did stay the whole game. And I, and I coached. Um so wow. you know, so th thinking about that perspective, right? And I think you you talk about it, and I, I get the I get the pleasure of listening to Kim a lot with uh, Wally Kozak and some stuff with the sharks, and she does such a great job of like describing uh, the game and, and skill development, not from a women's woman's perspective, but just from a hockey player's perspective. But I, I always love to hear, you know, the nuances of how you treat your players, but maybe tell us a little bit about um, from girls to boys. And, you know, you've been on both sides of the game and around the game and, you, and you're in, you're in the Mecca of hockey there where you see the boys and the girls and the parents, you know, what are the, what do you think the perspective is and the expectations of boys and girls' parents? Um, does it depend on level? Does it depend on their skill? Does it depend on what team they're on? Just a little bit about, you know, where you see that uh, from from where, how, your view of the parents and what they expect from their daughters. For sure. I think there is, now that I've got young daughters in the game, so my daughters are eight and six, you know, I'm around the rinks a lot more around younger parents. So they're kind of like little puppies like super excited for many years I coached U22 I coached college I coached U18 so they're at the end of the journey they're a little less energetic about <laughs> the whole thing um kind of very well tested and so I would say generally the boys hockey parents get crazier earlier than the girls hockey parents there's a little crazy in all of us myself <laughs> included um but I would say like they go all in a little bit more quickly uh, than the girls do. I think, you know, our, our hockey starts at the same time. So we have the learn to play program starting at three, four, five, the same way the boys do. Um, you know, I do think here they've got, you know, these rogue AAA leagues that start when they're five and six and they go full ice right out of the gate, some of them. And um, there just seems to be this urgency, um, you know, to be the next Connor McDavid or Connor Bedard or whoever the next Connor will be. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they just, there's a lot of FOMO. Um, and I do see that uh, creeping into the girls game a lot more. Uh, certainly I would never have dreamed 10 years ago that I would have seven and eight year old uh, players, parents asking me about spring hockey, um, you know, and whether they should do it or not do it with the girls. Uh, and I'm sure those conversations happen even younger with the boys, but um, that's not something that was a reality in our game uh, that many years ago. And now people feel like if I'm not doing all this and this and this, 
am I going to be missing out? And, um, you know, as someone who makes a living coaching hockey and running camps and clinics, um, certainly that's, it's good for business if you want to get on that bus. Um, but I really believe that with the girls, the, the end game still is the college hockey experience. Certainly they all want to make the Olympic team. Uh, I mean, we know that is virtually impossible. Um, you know, not to say it's not a dream to have, but to be in the top 20, certainly here in Canada, I mean, the chances are extremely low. And even if you look at the PWHL, there's six teams. I mean, hopefully by the time these girls get older, there'll be some more, but still the chances are extremely low. Whereas the chance of making uh, a college hockey roster as D1, D3, U sports, club hockey, I mean, there's a ton of opportunity. And so that urgency means you've got to finish high school first. There's no exceptional player status. You know, you're not gra getting drafted into the dub or the O mm -hmm. or what. Like, there's a pretty um, normal path for the girls that you can't really accelerate through. And I think that uh, normalizes the parents a little bit. Um, but like I said, what, there is still a lot of crazy. And again, being in Toronto, we're just as crazy as the rest of them. Yeah, Kim, it, it's funny because statistically speaking, uh, boys hockey versus, I guess, girls hockey going to college, um, girl hockey players statistically have a massively higher chance of actually playing in college should they want to do that than boys. Now, it's funny because that number's dropping because the player population is growing, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, th those dreams at the young age are, are interesting to me. Um, and I always wanted to say, like we say this almost on every episode now, to the to the audience listening, you're not crazy. The hockey world is crazy, right? If you're listening to this show, you probably have a grip on something. Uh, but yeah, we we Mike and I discuss this all the time on our kids play hockey. Just the, the FOMO and the the kind of the, I, I call them the rookie hockey parent that's just trying to find their grip. It's like, hey, relax. <laughs> You've got some time. You're cultivating a love of the game here. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to say, because I, I just, and you're right. I mean, the FOMO there is is <clears> for the <throat> boys and girls. And I'm just seeing it more and more. Um, it is getting a little, you know, maybe because of the PWHL and the fact that you could, you know, potentially play pro hockey, depending on what, what parent put their kids into a sport and why they do it. Right. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, because I, because this is my perspective, right? I don't see the the cutthroat part of it as much. Like, I don't see, like on the boys' side, it's very, everything secretive. That person's going to that skating coach. That person's doing it. I mean, I just worked with nine uh, prep girls this last week, just getting ready for school. And I just found, like, their ability on the ice together and the parents all sitting together, and they're all kind of in a common, like, man, we just want what's, we want best for our daughters to have a really great experience first. And the other stuff will kind of take care of itself. And the, and the, like, do you find that, you know, in, in an all female program, do you find that, that maybe that, I don't even know what the, it's not compassion, but you know, the, the, the ability, the, like the, the, the want of other players to succeed longer is is there more than maybe in the male side of the sport? Yeah, I mean, I most of my experience on the female side, and I'm actually the director of coach and player development at the Toronto Leaside Wildcats. We're the biggest girls hockey association in the world. And actually, if we were a country, we would be the 10th biggest country in women's hockey. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a fun fact. Um, and so... I mean, Sherry grew up not far from where I live now in the in the Toronto universe. So I think there is some of that cutthroatedness at the top level in the sense that it's very easy to move around mm -hmm. and find the next great team. Uh, like I said, if, if you live where I live, you're 25 minutes away from six centers that all have top level. And so at the, the tippy top, there's that like urgency to be with the best. And, but that's a very small percentage of the population for the majority of the population that we work with at Leaside or all these organizations. I, I think you're right, Mike, the experience is a huge piece of it. And that's a big part of what, what we sell is that, you know, you see a path. If you want to get to U22 elite or you want to get a scholarship, we have that path and, and it's, it's mapped out for you. But if, if hockey's not your be all and end all, or you want to play at a high level, but you're also a soccer player or you want to play at a high level, but you know, you know, U18 is going to be your last year of hockey. 
we offer that too, right? So that's, you know, the joy we have in the numbers we have, we have 1600 players. Um, we have every, you know, uh, iteration of, of hockey and level that you could possibly want. And I think that gives families um, a lot of comfort because you don't know, you know, my little eight-year-old who says she loves hockey and I want to do hockey, hockey, you know, if she wants to play college hockey or in the PW, that's 10, 15 years from now. Right. I don't know what she's going to like three months from now. Right. But I know she loves hockey and maybe she five years from now is playing at a lower level because she loves it, but rock climbing has taken over it. Right. So I think that experiential piece is, is really big in the girls knowing that they tend to play more sports for longer than the boys do. Right. Um, the academics are a really big piece because they're looking to get scholarships and then they, they know that again, the McDavid money isn't coming anytime soon. So they have to get a quote, real person job that's what my mom t calls it a real, person, real job. person job i don't have a real person job just so you know yeah that's the uh the defining line you have a hockey person job that's i'm a hockey mean. person job but um <laughs> yeah I, I think the experience is huge and that goes back to what i was saying earlier about the social piece now that experience could still be like we want to win it all and we're going to be the top team in the province for sure that's there as well um but i there are very few win at all cost um programs or teams that last longer than one season because of course when you have the win at all costs let's get everyone together and somebody's got to be the first line center and someone's got to be starting goalie and someone's got to be the top d pair and they're not that team blows up the following year and they all go to the other teams that are 25 minutes away so it's not a sustainable uh effort at least not in the the toronto area Kim, could you talk about some of the differences between uh, that you've seen between female coaches and and male coaches? Besides, oh, besides giving birth, yeah. Other than that. I haven't seen that from no. the guys yet. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. seen some crazy instances on the ice. You can imagine <laughs> coaching seven and eight year olds. Like you're always worried you're going to get submarine by a kid who thinks they can yeah. stop who can't actually stop. Um, yeah, I would say first of all, I'm a big believer that you know we want great coaches. And if some of them happen to be male and some of them happen to be female and some of them identify, doesn't matter to me. Um, I know at our organization, we're almost one third female coaches on the competitive side, which is like extremely high That's compared right. to a lot of other organizations. So um, we're proud of that. But at the same time, you know, I've coached with and against a lot of terrific male coaches that I'd be sad if they weren't in the female game. Um, so I would say, you know, obviously, you can only have been female if you're female. So, um, you know, that is a big piece. I know a lot of the the women we have coaching have played at a high level, but many of them have not. And this is something, um, you know, maybe Sherry can relate to as well. When I first got into coaching, I remember I coached, co-coached with this woman who is, she was at the end of her coaching career with her daughter. So she had co coached her from novice to U18 AA all the way through. And I came on as this new like co-head coach with her, fresh out of playing pro, just started my business. And um, we're kind of talking about responsibilities. And she's like, okay, Kim, here's how it's going to go. You're going to do all the hockey stuff. You want to change the power play. You want to run the practices. You want to do this. That's you. I'm like, great. She's like, I'm going to do all the other stuff. And in my head, I'm like, what's the other stuff? There's other stuff? <laughs> I didn't know there's other stuff. Yeah. So that year was my best coaching year because I just, you know, I was like, oh, we're going to do this drill and we're going to do that drill. And she did the stuff, which I didn't have to do any of. And then I realized the following year when I got my own, whole own team, what that stuff was. <laughs> and just so everyone's clear on the stuff, right? The, the you know, the scheduling, the player management, mm -hmm. the parent management, the skills that coming out of pro at whatever age I was, 27, I hadn't really had a real person job. I didn't know how to deal with the dad who's the partner at the law firm who <laughs> wants his daughter to miss the practice. And he's going to like sneakily worm his way in there to ask me. And I'm going to be nice and say yes. And then all of them are going to miss practice. And I've created my own monster. Um, and I think that's a, a bit of a challenge sometimes with our younger female coaches is that they don't necessarily have um, as much like real world job experience, life experience. Um, but they have all the hockey piece. And then you've got the women who maybe never played at a high level in hockey. Maybe they played another sport who want to give back to the game. And they're always nervous. Like, Kim, I don't know if I can do it. And I said, listen, you've got the people skills. 
you've worked, you know, you know how to deal with the parents. You've been a parent. Um, I love teachers as coaches, of course, like that's a no brainer. Um, but I think there's a place, you know, for all these different pieces, the women who've played at a high level, the women who are just want to give back to the game. And then, you know, the, the males who have, you know, similar experiences, they might've played at a high level. They might not have, I think there's a little bit for everyone. Um, I just know with my daughters, like, first of all, they don't want me as their coach. They keep asking when they get a new coach, which is hilarious. Uh, cause that's not happening anytime soon, <laughs> but they certainly do react differently. Um, to the female coaches than they do from the male coaches. And we have some fantastic male coaches, but there's a, just a different connectivity. And so I always encourage people, I'm not saying you have to have a head coach who's female. You don't even necessarily need to have an assistant coach that's female, although that's like a hot market for sure. Um, but to have a female on your bench um, when you're coaching on the women's side of the game is absolutely critical to have that someone there who can connect with the players in that way. Um, I think that's a, a really important piece of the puzzle. So I know it's hard to get the all-female bench. It's hard to find the head coaches who are willing to um, put in that much time and effort, but an assistant, trainer, somebody, uh, even just a skills coach who's there once a week, I think could make a, a really big difference um, on a girls' team's bench. Do you think there's a – do you think that's – I mean, from your some, from the business perspective – you know, because we speak, we we I think our audience is a, a lot of different type of people, and I think a, a a lot of it is people that are coaching and just getting into coaching. And what I find is I don't know if the female coaching side thinks that there is a a longer lifespan to get into coaching. I, I see figure skaters that turn into hockey coaches. I see you know a couple of couple of like very niche skills coaches that work with a couple of kids but they don't coach they just they just coach players they're females but they coach male professional players and skating and edge control and things like that maybe they can't i don't know maybe they don't feel comfortable teaching shooting or something like that to an nhl player because it's different mechanics or they're, or that like the strength part but do you think there's a like do you think that's like what comes first like the chicken and the egg there do, do we need more female coaches to understand there's a business side like I see every male coach that that gets out of the AHL says, I could be a, I could just be a hockey director and I could go be a, a, for the rest of my life, run hockey programs. And, and I don't see that in the women's game. I, I, I mean, I see it a little bit and it's changing obviously, but where do you think that lifespan is? Like where, what do we need to do as, as a sport to convince more women that retire from playing to say, no, 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 you don't have to just give private lessons and be like an in niche environment. You can actually to be in a total female hockey type of environment and and really encourage more women to come around. You're kind of like what Sherry's doing with her programming too. I mean, does it take leaders like yourselves to just say, listen, we're going to put a stake in the ground here and make this happen? I'd, I'd like to hear from both of you guys, actually, uh, Kim and Sherry. Yeah, I'll go first. I think, you know, what Sherry's doing is awesome. Yeah, Like, what well, – I think it's important people know you can make a, a living in the female game. And that's not to say anything about, you know, people who are working on the men's side of the game. I think, you know, all these opportunities we see, you know, women who are becoming assistant coaches at that level and hopefully head coaches one day. I, I think that's amazing. I will say I do have a soft spot for female hockey um, and I'm in Toronto. So it's very easy for me to stick in this niche in the city that I'm in. It would be very different if I was in a small town somewhere else to, to myopically work with the girls. But I do think we have to hold ourselves up as role models. And I, I'm very proud of the fact I'm a mother of three and I went into labor with my kid on the bed. Um, I'm proud of the fact that I started this business from nothing. I've been doing it for 17 years and this is all I do. All I do is coach girls hockey. I mean, it's amazing, but you know, and I, I, I played at a, decent level as a good hockey player, but, you know, I'm really more proud of the fact that I'm a role model for having a business, doing what I love in the sport that I love. It's very sustainable. And I, I think it's really important for us as women to champion women who are involved in the game, males game, female game, you know, the, the Paralympic game, like anyone who's <laughs> involved, I think we need to, there needs to be a light shined on us. Um, and whether you're, you know, I have a former player of mine who is a videographer, uh, you know, she, like she does all the videos and team photos and all this. And she just called me last week to say, like, 
PWHL is going to bring her in as like a, a video person. Like she's making her living taking pictures and yeah. videos of hockey. That's her full-time gig. She's female. I think that's really, really important for people to see that, that it, it can be a side hustle. It can be a very lucrative side hustle. Um, doing it at full, as a full-time job is obviously a, a lot. And I think that the people who sometimes get into it, Mike, to your point, you know, they recognize that, hey, if I just do a couple of skills clinics here and there, you know, I get paid by e-transfer or Venmo. <laughs> That's easy to take it to the point where you actually are making a full-time business out of it as an entrepreneur is a is a massive leap. Um, and that not everyone's built to be a, an entrepreneur. But then there are so many more options now for women in the game of hockey that you could not have ever coached. You could have not ever played hockey and you could be very, very, very involved in this awesome sport on either the male or female side. So I think it's championing the women who are doing it and getting us out there and saying, Hey, Sally, you could do that. And it doesn't, you don't have to be the best skater in order to do that. If you want to be the voice of the PWHL Toronto and do the, be the announcer, right? Like that's a, a job possibility now that, you know, wasn't there, you know, a, a year ago. Although I do joke, like when they say, oh, professional women's hockey has arrived. I said, yeah, well, we were doing it pretty well 20 years ago too. But, you know, there weren't any, many zeros behind the paycheck. But, um, you know, we'll get, we'll get there eventually, yeah. hopefully. Uh, but I think lots of paths forward for, for women in the game. Speaking of 20 years ago, when uh, we played against Leeside, Leeside was one of the first programs that I ever saw that had female coaches. They had two female coaches at this at that time. And that time it was only men in the league and I've only seen men coaching. And when I saw that, it's like, oh, we can coach, you know, like it just kind of it's not really something that's really apparent, but it did plant the seed. And I always remember seeing them on the bench and then later did like in got back into coaching. But I think visibility is so important, like just seeing women behind the bench, like there's women that drive the Zamboni, you know, you can do broadcasting, you can do youth hockey, there's all kinds of roles. And, and uh, I speak a lot about women working in hockey, that there is so many jobs for you now. And with the NHLCA, you know, Lindsay Pinal, she's creating a lot of opportunities for a lot of women around the game. And it's like, if these kids, you know, they finish NCAA college hockey and they get on as an assistant coach and and want to give back to the game it's like i think we just need women wanting to come back into the game and like like kim said like you don't need to be scared it's like get in be an assistant coach someone can mentor you or or follow you know follow someone in your home rank or your hometown and just get back involved in the game and get back to the game but i think the visibility of having women on the ice for parents to see you know women coaching coaching their daughters i think is so important and impactful yeah, and if you're a hockey director like Kim is and, and Sherry and you're running hockey programs, provide the support structure, men and female. I've seen more men and female coaches not succeed because of what Kim said earlier. Like, oh, I just I just thought I was coming here to coach. Like, I didn't know I had to do all this other stuff. Like, this is like 27 weeks of my life. And it's I a full time job. I've never I've never used yeah. Sport Engine, and I've never used you know I've never had to do a a calendar app and figure out what girls are playing soccer and lacrosse and have to actually go to school sometimes. Like you can't leave on a Wednesday and go to a tournament. Like so, I think that you know giving if you want more female coaches in your organization or male good male coaches, find a way to support them and give them the 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 ramp to get to a point where they can kind of take over and be entrepreneurial instead of like, oh, by the way, we're, hey, see you later. Or maybe you'll see if you'll make it to the banquet. Good luck. But it behooves you to educate. Like, yeah. that's one of the things I see in organizations too, Mike. It's like, oh, you'll figure it out. Like, no, no, no. Do, do it. Do it. A <laughs> couple hours of education. You just solve right. a million problems. I, 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 you know, that's right. one thing. You know, I, a couple of things I want to add to this is, um, you know, for the broad audience here, <clears throat> it can be easy to forget, like, look, as a white male, there's no shortage of white males in hockey, right? And I've been seeing that since I got into hockey as a young kid. Um, it's easy to forget <clears throat> different ethnicities, women in the game. Until you see it, you might not realize it's possible. And if you were a young girl 30 years ago, you weren't seeing it. Now... If you're a young girl today, like my daughter, who's eight years old, professional hockey, and Kim, not to take away what you said, for, for sure, it's very visible at the moment, more visible than ever, I'll say it like that. That's a very real possibility in her mind now, because she can see it, all right? Um, 
that's just something important to keep in mind. A, a follow-up question I wanted to ask you that I think pertains to this is, and this is for everybody here, um, both both Kim and Sherry and Mike too. You, Mike, you've coached professional women's hockey. How can men be an ally in and support this, right? Because again, we're talking about women jumping in the game. Uh, the, the future of the game is men and women working together to make it a better game, right? So how can men be an ally in this situation, whether they're coaches, parents, uh, players, anything in between that? Well, in my experience, like the dads are great allies, right? Because their daughter's playing hockey and they are all in, right? So they are our greatest supporters. And I've been to, I'd say at least half a dozen, if not more PWHL games. And there's a lot of screaming eight-year-olds, no question about that. Um, But there's a whole lot of dads with those screaming eight-year-olds who are championing our our sport as well. So um, I, I think it's, again, it goes back to that visibility and people understanding that, quite frankly, it's a different game. It is not what you're going to see when you watch the Leafs versus watching PWHL Toronto. It's a different sport in a lot of ways. And so you're, you know, it'd be like volleyball versus beach volleyball. Like they're volleyball, but they're a little different than each other. And, And I think that's okay. I think for a long time with women's hockey, we've been like very much stuck comparing ourselves directly to the men's game. And I don't think we need to do that. Mm, I think it's a very, very different entity. And I'm excited when I see, you know, the marketing attempts and the growth of the women's game now to sort of sell it as like, it's not the NHL's little sister. I really hope it's an entity in and of itself and that people can get behind it as a, as a unique sport in which it is. Um, So I think not that we don't want to be tied to the men's game, obviously, There's a lot of great parallels there, but I think um, to celebrate it for what it is and not uh, put it down for the things that it's not, um, I think is a a really, really important piece. And a lot of the men will have seen both, right? If they played hockey themselves, they would have been on the men's side and now they're on the women's side and and they see that it's just, and, and when I mean differently, I just don't mean as girls on the ice like the strategical pieces of the game can be played very differently. The ways you can have success in the female game are very different than the way you can on the men's game. There's ways to teach it that because we don't have full body checking, there's certain skills that work way better in the women's game than they do in the guys game. And um, I think you have to watch a lot of women's hockey to get the nuance of that. But when you start to understand that, um, you know, you, you do start to see how it is a different sport and I can nerd about nerd out about that piece. Oh, all day, we're going to think, in a few minutes now that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that <laughs> it is, you know, you're not going there expecting, you know, the, the Scott Stevens, Eric Lindros blue line, like, it's just not, Yeah, we don't need to talk about that. That ruined my youth. That was the last day of my youth when that happened. So I was very can... sad. I was a big Lindros fan too. Me um, too. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's just understanding that it's different and it's great that it's different and celebrate that it's different. And right. um, like I said, I think the PWHL is doing a great job of that. And I think, you know, the Canada-US rivalry has always done a great job of that. Um, you know, they they are their own, in their own league, oh, <laughs> their own really? level. And, um, you know, you watch that and you're like, what sport is this? Because that's exciting hockey. <laughs> yeah. No question about that. Well, then, again, Sherry and Mike, anything to add to that? Just about how men can be an ally, because I think it's an it's an important question to discuss. Go ahead, Sherry. Oh no, just yeah, having I mean, having the support of dads and having the support of men um, is just very important, and um, yeah, love to see it. I love to see like when you go to games and there's little boys and dads taking their little boys. Like the more that we can expose our game to everyone, I think it's just going to help grow. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, it's it's getting those dads that are like, like, like played pro or they played college and and you, and they're intense, like they're you know, and then say, listen, you have to bring that same intensity. The one thing I learned, listen, I coached with Colt Nor, I mean, on and, and a female bench, and he didn't coach like he coached like it, there was no like oh, you know, be careful the corner, like it was like okay, you know, you're gonna coach, but to, to and I've learned so much from Kim listening to her in other things. Um, and just the way she teaches and and how the nuances of the game and how it's changed. But sometimes I think as a male coach and a dad, you have to understand that the game is different. Mm. Your daughters, the objective for where they want to be, if they want to play prep and and college, it is a different game. 
And and sometimes you have to be willing to let that game happen instead of trying to make you know have them play a, a game at eight and nine and ten that's just not going to be there for them. Like right. this, the, the you know the the focus on what they're trying to learn and how they could be successful. Really, to Kim's point, sometimes is well. There's there's other ways to look at that. If you're a, a dad, then you played hockey. You don't even understand that because you've never been in the female game. So I think that's where you know getting more female coaches that played at a high level, that understand body position, that understand how important the stick is, to understand that you know you're not taking rips from the top of the blue line. Uh, you know, and 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 your shot shot selection has to be different. All that kind of stuff comes into play and you don't know any of that if you were just a guy who played college hockey and now your daughter's playing yeah kim let me throw it back to you here for a minute because um i think this will be a really interesting discussion too we'll get back to the question in a minute but you know we are talking about the differences between boys and girls hockey a little bit talk to me about some of those skill sets those tactics i think that would be a really interesting conversation sherry feel free to jump in as well because mike i think you're making a good point i think a lot of people just go with well, hockey is the same thing across the board. And that, that's not true, right? The, 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 it is a different sport. Like you said, I think that we benefit from looking at it like that. Um, extremely similar. <laughs> I think that's a fair thing to say. But what are the skill sets and the tactics that differ? How much time have you got? <laughs> yeah, about, uh, two more <laughs> hours. No, yeah. <laughs> go Great. ahead. So let's go. So um, a lot of this has to do with personality. And the female tendency to want to play a certain way within a group game. So I think I'm sure you guys have talked about this before, right? They they are coach pleasers. They want to do it right. Uh, I think you put something on the board, stand here, do this, and they will stand here and do that, right. even if the puck is eight feet somewhere else where they should probably go get it. That is a wonderful thing when coaching the girls. Right. I love coaching all girls because they sit there and listen, rapt attention. They're not shooting pucks <laughs> against the boards when I Punching blow each whistle. other. Yeah. They're paying attention to every word I say. Right. The problem with that is it sucks some of the creativity out of the game. If uh, as a coach, you go, OK, I can I can exploit this. I can exploit the girl's ability to do exactly what I say, because they will go exactly where I point in the forecheck and they will stand exactly where I want on the breakout. And that can bring success at the young age groups if you have structure and players who are willing to do it because a lot of the other teams you play against might not have the same skill set as you. So if you decide you're going to forecheck with three and U11 hockey, I haven't met a lot of U11Ds who can solve that problem, right? So that's going to bring you success, relying on the girl's ability to do exactly what you say. They think everything in hockey is always and never. So on this drill, guys, you're going to take the puck down the wall and turn. Do I always do that? Is that, I'm always going to do that. You're like, no, you're it's just a, a tool for your toolbox. But that's the way the girls think in general. I'm generalizing here, but I would say the vast majority of them think that way. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do, so I coached the top levels for a really long time, and now I'm at the grassroots. And so my entire job now is like, how do we break that, Right. right? That's always going to be there. They're always going to want to do what I say. How can I teach them to be creative right. by doing right. what I say? So in the development of young girls, these are the two big ones. And I think they go well with their personalities. The first is I always tell them to skate to daylight. Channel your inner Bobby Orr. They don't know who Bobby Orr is. Channel <laughs> your puck hog tendency. Why would I do that? Because the girls will throw the puck away all day long they don't want to make a mistake or they someone told them they have to pass or they're worried Sherry won't be my friend if I don't pass it to her. I'm generalizing, but this is a truism mm -hmm. from eight year olds all the way to 28 year olds to Sherry is nodding. This is yeah. true. And so I teach them to skate to daylight, get that puck, find where the space is, figure it out, keep going. Right. That's the number one skill I teach young players. They have to be able to solve the problem on their own. And you might say, Kim, you're going to have a whole bunch of puck hogs. Well, no, I'm going to teach them how to pass soon. That's going to happen. But with the girls, they need to have the confidence. That's the biggest word, word in girls hockey. They have to have the confidence to be able to solve the problem on their own. And often, this is a, a kind of a throwback to an earlier question, when they're with the boys, their tendency to do that is much, much lower. They will not hang on to the puck and try to go end to end. They will give it off for whatever reason, 
that, you know, millions of years ago was stuck in our male, female. I don't know why they do it, but they won't do it. With the girls, they'll do it. So skating to daylight and keeping the puck, I think is a really, really critical one at the youngest age groups to give them confidence. The other one is the word I yell the most, which is hunting. Mm. We talk about hunting. This is physicality, right? The girls are too nice. They don't want to run anybody over. Well, not my kid. My kid wants to run <laughs> including the net, everything is going to fall. It's like bowling. Um, <laughs> but that idea to hunt, right? Angling, stick on puck, all the things we want to teach. When you use the word hunt with the girls, it's like a button goes off in their head and they understand like, oh, I'm going in hard. I am going to, we hunt with two at U8 and U9. We send two into every every single battle because we want them, we want the first one to go in and get the puck. We want the second one or the first one to go and get the body in the stick and the second one to get the puck. And we're solving that problem at the youngest age groups. You know, I know Sherry's, you know, coaching a lot of uh, girls in hockey, right? We don't want it to be a no touching sport. And that I think sometimes is what they think it is. It's not all skills and floating around with the puck. You've got to be able to hunt. Right. And then that confidence they get from that physicality on the, I guess, the defensive side of the puck is the secret weapon on the offensive side of the puck. So you don't need a toe drag or a Michigan or any of those moves to succeed in girls hockey because there's no body checking. If you understand how to protect the puck and build a wall and you can drive the net, you can be the next Natalie Spooner guys. Why did she have 20 goals in the PWHL? Because she is the best player in the world at protecting the puck and moving her feet and getting to the net. I love Natalie, I coached her a long time ago. She does not have the best skill, stick skills in the world. She is by no means the most skilled hockey player in the universe. But that is the hack in girls hockey. Your ability to use your physicality on offense to drive the play is the most important skill, in my opinion, whether you're a D or you're a forward. Once you unlock that, that level of confidence to do it, that's what really changes the game. And that's when you watch Canada and US and it looks like it's full body checking, right? right? That's really what they're able to do. They, they know physicality on offense and they know physicality on defense. And I think that's, that's really the secret sauce. Once you can teach players that ability of puck protection and to get pucks into the middle. I always joke in girls hockey, they might as well not have a middle of the ice. It's just a track. Everyone just skates around the outside because no one wants to touch anybody. We can just get rid of the middle part. And that's what I'm trying to do is get them into the middle of the ice. I told you I talked for a long time, guys. No, but you're, but, you're, but I, I think that, I mean, that's like, I mean, that's my argument sometimes to youth parents with young girls is you've hit it. Like, I don't know, you might've said it 15 times in that, in that, you know, way too long explanation about women's hockey. But if you, no, <laughs> but if you, if you, you the, it's the confidence piece, it's, like you know i we have i used to argue all the you know, we got to play upper we got to play an upper level we got to play the best to be the best so like you can't be the best if you never touch the puck if right. you don't get the opportunity to even try a toe drag how would you know like so i think that's uh, like our our inclination as parents uh, with young girls or boys anybody right is to put them into a place of struggle instead of finding the confidence first and then learn how to struggle through that. And I think that's where, you know, that's where we lose a lot of really great players because they all of a sudden they go, Oh my God, like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So is the argument like, and that, you know, and Sherry, we've had this, how many times have we had this on our podcast about, you know, you know, when are, not to take Lee's question, I guess, but you know, when is that transition? Go for it. You can take right? it. From, from, yeah. from like, I'm a parent of a girl. I want her to. I want her to be Natalie Spooner. So I got to put her in a AAA boys part because she's she's a better skater. Now she can't do it physically. She, it's hard for her to get to the puck. She's not. She's getting you know knocked around a little bit. She's she's you know. So when is that change? It is in 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 reality. Is it just you got to look at your daughter and say she can handle it or she can't? Like where is it that that confidence? How long do we in that? Like what what what's more important? Confidence. And the ability to think you can do it or fighting to get there. Well, I think just so we can fact check this, pretty sure Spooner played girls hockey the whole way through, but we might need to look that up. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think I have a lot of thoughts on this. I would say the on-ramp in girls hockey, if you want a scholarship, 
in Canada, I know your ages are a little different. So for you guys, it would be U16. For us, it would be U15 AA. That's the level you need to get to. Uh, however you get there, what weird journey you get there, that's when the college scouts are really starting to come out. So grade, you know, eight, nine, are, that's when it's really starting now in girls hockey. So I, I hesitate to say it doesn't matter, but I actually don't think it matters. I was playing house league at 13. Mm. So somehow I figured it out. Okay. So I don't think you need to be like the best of the best up until that point, but I do think you need to be in the top tier at that age group. If that's the level that you want to get to. So how do you get there in a way that is going to bring you success based on the position you play? Here's what I see. And again, this is in Toronto and Ontario. Most of the girls who are playing top tier boys are playing defense. That's okay. Not a problem. Okay. When they're playing defense, they're not necessarily the rushing defensemen. Usually we're just nice and responsible. We're a little bit more stay at home defensemen. That's a great skill set. And we need tons of those in women's hockey too. But then they come over to the women's game. Usually in Ontario, they're coming around. You do get some at like U11 and U13, but for sure they're coming by U15. For sure, for sure. And you would think, and they think they're just going to come and run the show. And some of them do. But often they come and they move the puck too quickly. They don't want to hang on to it, right? They're playing uh, like a more passive style, um, a less aggressive style, because for whatever reason in the boys, that's where they ended up. So I'll tell a quick story. I had a player who played for me for many years who was about 6'1", um, shot like like could break glass with her shot, huge defenseman, had great wheels, could go end-to-end. -end. When she played U22 Elite, could go end-to-end -end all day. No question. And who was going to stop her? Giant person. And I remember when she first started playing U22, she would stop at the red line and dump it in. Like mm. she would be leading the rush. What are you doing? She's like, well, when I played boys, they I, I was told I couldn't go over center. <laughs> and I was like, she played triple A boys here, like for yeah. a good organization. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you can go over center because I wouldn't <laughs> defend you if you paid me a million bucks. I just turn style and let you in the yeah. door. <laughs> and and I was like, well, that's really interesting. Because well, I actually I used to be a center. I was like, oh, okay. She's like, I played center, triple A boys. And then I scored too many goals, so they made me a D. I'm like, oh, and then they told you you couldn't go over center. Okay, so not saying that that happens with everybody, but I don't know that the world of boys hockey, men's hockey, their number one mission is not to have the girls succeed. Like, it's not that they don't want the girls to succeed, right. but it's that's not their big thing of like, let's champion this girl so she gets to the top, top, top. That's not the number one priority. Not that it should be. But in girls hockey, we want, we're championing all those girls to get to the tippy top all the time. And there is that issue that if it is a player who's quite good, is she going to get submarined um, just because of it's an ego thing? Yeah. Or, you know, I have met many girls who've come over to the girls game from boys and the, you know, they the dad will say, the mom will say, oh, it's because she, she wants to be around other girls. And then they'll pull me aside and say, actually, the coach said they don't want girls on the team anymore. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so but the you know the girl doesn't know that but mm -hmm. that's the truth and i'm not saying that's always the case you know there were some of our best players in the world you know played boys quite a long way through and the captains of their you know triple a teams and and all of that but they're the outliers the right. majority of them when you see it the <clears throat> who's the top levels uh, at least in north america europe is different um but in north america many of them you know, have at least onboarded, like I said, U16s for you guys, U15s to us, and have played, you know, girls the rest of the way through. I would say the one, you know, the goalies can last a little bit longer if they're great. Obviously, they don't have to body check. And, um, you know, the other thing, of course, is if you want to play Team Ontario, Team Canada, any of that, you got to be playing girls hockey. So you can't make those teams if you're playing with the boys. So if that's an aspiration or if you want to get a scholarship, they're not coming to some double A game in Richmond Hill where I live to watch a girl play hockey. They're going to go to the tournament with 180 teams and pick the girls from there. So, um, yeah, I would say that's the logical onboarding. But again, the social piece, you know, I think tr trumps everything else. And once the girls get with the girls, they tend to level up their play 
um, because they feel more comfortable in the dress room and on the ice with their teammates. Seems to be a, a common oh, thread too. No, no, I just say it seems to be a common thread. I look for congruencies between episodes and that that, you know, if you are a young girl or you have a young girl that joining a girl's team at some point, um, you know, we I think it was looked at as, oh, that's obvious, but it's looking like, no, that's actually the pathway, right? If you want to do this, you know, post high school, you need to find a good organ girls organization that can help you develop in that side of the game. But go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, I'm coaching a 10U team here, girls team. So I have girls that are eight, nine, and 10 years old. And they're just, you know, starting to play travel hockey. But like you can get into skills and all that. But I think the biggest piece is when you're starting a girls team or girls program is to not overlook the social aspect of it. I feel like girls need to have fun to win. And I feel like boys need to win to have fun. And what I mean by that is like the girls with their locker room dance parties, the pool parties, um, a lot of the social stuff that they do, I think, really factors into their team bond and their confidence. And without the girls, especially like having that social and confidence and like getting them to come out of their shell and be one team is the little stuff like that that's not on ice related is is trying to get their confidence up. And the girls, I find they like, really don't want to disappoint you. They are very literal. And then um like if you just give them like when they're doing their drills, good job, good job. Don't worry if you follow, we're in practice, it's fine. I just feel like the the more confidence you can give them by telling them they're doing good and and um, you know, just like it, especially earlier in the season, get them to become a team, you know, just through the social stuff. Like and and if you are coaching a new team, you know, get them get them to bond pretty quickly with your off ice stuff. Yeah, that's the classic girls hockey thing, right? You go in the dress room, you've never heard so much talking in your life, and then you go Dance on the ice. parties, yeah. You go on the ice, and it's like crickets. <laughs> like, what, what happened to that dance party, guys? <laughs> no one wants to call for the puck because nobody wants to be wrong. Right? Yeah. They don't want to call for it at the wrong time. I mean, it's it's fascinating, and this goes back to the earlier question of why do you want females on the bench? Because we know that. <laughs> we know yeah, that people I talk on the bench not or on the ice, not because they don't know the answer, because they're worried about getting it wrong or they don't want to be the one that stands out right like i haven't run a lot of boys hockey stuff but i'm guessing when you pick a guy to demonstrate the drill he's like let's go i'm the one you do that with the girls and they are scared and don't want to be that girl yeah but they'll just do it wrong yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah oh the guys yeah they'll be the worst player on the it's, like, it's great that you jumped i got there, this buddy, but, but uh, the I girls the will be the doing. yeah the girls will be the best player on the ice yeah. and will not want to show it because yeah. <laughs> not only do they not want to do it wrong they don't want to be seen as the girl who oh she thinks she's so good yeah. oh yeah. coach yeah. picked her like these are just truisms i'm not, right. it's neither yeah. good nor bad i've coached yeah. every age and every level of girls hockey like i've seen it all and that happens with the seven-year-olds and it happens with the 17 year olds so that is something that you know being a female in the female game really gives you that insight that it would be very, very hard to have, um, you know, unless you were super in tune with your teenage daughters as a male and you really understood those those mindsets. So it's definitely a, a secret power that we have as as women in the game. I you think, know, yeah, the, the empathy that we have from coaching, like, Kim, you were that little girl. I was that little girl. Like, we were 13, 14-year-old little girls. We know that social pressure that comes from other girls and being a woman. Like, I think we we can coach with that sort of empathy and stuff because we've lived it, whereas men, I think they just do the straight-up game. Like, here's your drills. Here's your power play. Here's your stuff. They don't have – they haven't experienced that emotion that we have and that social pressure that we have um, in girls' hockey. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but the funny thing is, just to, to get off the girls' hockey side too, is that that's happening more and more for the boys because yeah. of social media and because yeah. of the and because of the way boys now, young boys. Not I'm talking about eighteen year olds. Well, eighteen year olds too, but like in the right. in the in the in the stages of development, the the ability for any child to look at somebody else succeed and them not is now, like, I didn't know I wasn't any good. I, I thought I was pretty good in my town. I'm like, I'm one of the, I'm the best player out here. But if I had social media back then, I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm terrible. Like, I'm a, not a good 12-year-old. Like, so so I think it's it's both. It's like for men and women, and, 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 the, and from the guy's perspective, men that are coaching hockey that played at a high level, they don't – you never went through that experience. So it's hard to have that empathy and that understanding that, oh, my God, like, these kids – like, no, they're really not 
doing that well. Kind of yeah. like Kim, like your daughter, like, don't tell me I'm doing good because I'm not. Like, I know I'm not doing well, so don't tell me I'm doing well. But I think that's, I, I think it's it's melding into the boy side too, as far as, and, and, and Lee talks about this a lot on the, the mental fitness side, is all of us as coaches have to understand that that pressure is so much greater now yeah, and a lot of it's our fault, right? Because I'm showing my kids, oh, look what this person's doing. Look at that person in Toronto's doing. Look at that person in Australia's doing. We never had to do that, and now yeah. it's like everybody is in. You know, everybody's at the same level or the same age, and they're at these other levels you never knew about. So I think it's there's there's a lot to be said for both, but no doubt about that. Having a female on a female coach on a team is important. Not a well, a for the locker room. B for the social piece, C for the peer piece. But I think just a lot of that ability to have another person in the room that really does understand and, and can talk uh, to a group of young ladies in a way that, you know, most males just can't. I think some of the stuff, too, that parents don't see is what goes on behind a bench. Like I've had girls in a tight game, a 0-0 zero, zero game, or it goes to overtime, and there's there's some girls that are like, no coach like you know they don't want to go because they don't want to be the one that screws up right and they'll just be like oh my leg hurts or something right and then you get lit up by parents like why wasn't my kid on the ice they don't know that the kid has like anxiety from that pressure they don't want to be on the ice so you put out other kids and it's just stuff like that that goes on that like that parents don't even know about well, and this but, is where communication comes in <clears throat> i was going to say too like it's a broad thing that we talk about all the time that 10 out of 10 issues always involve some some form of form of communication right so and this goes every different direction right coaches talking to parents parents talking to coaches players to coaches and back and forth um and i think that that's something that you know uh, kim you were talking before about girls on boys teams a lot of times i find <clears throat> in those situations there's not much dialogue between those families and the coach when there really needs to be right of expectations of understanding um, I would never agree with a coach, I think, that says, well, we don't want girls on their team, but you got to have that conversation, right? It, it, and and it's, it's, it's a real disservice to everybody when you don't communicate. And I think that, Mike, to your point, we're in a time period now where the kids especially, but it's true for adults too, there's hyper-awareness now. There's so much more awareness of everything going on around us uh, because of the way society is, social media is, that it's creating new problems. But with that said, we're so used to texting now, especially kids, that we're not communicating. So you have hyper awareness without the communication. That is not a good recipe for success. So a lot of the times, especially when I'm working with the younger ages, and I mean 12 down, although this 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 is still something I have to do with the older um, kids, we do communication drills where you're not going to get a pass if I don't hear you asking yeah. for the pass. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Mike Mike said this on a show once. It was really impactful. The goal of every drill should not be to conclude with a shot. Sometimes the drill is, no, communicate and figure out a, a way out of this problem. And in my opinion, this goes broader than just girls or boys hockey. That's a skill set we need to develop. And I think Sherry and Kim, you brought up a good point that it probably benefits <clears throat> different aspects of the game in different ways. But like, I'm just talking about that's something I'm seeing on a broader sense across the board. I mean, and, and look, I can sum it like this. In society, we have a hard time speaking with each other now. Like, that was not always true. You could disagree with someone not that long ago. It would be a conversation. You'd buy a sandwich and you'd move on. That's not how it works anymore. So anyway, not trying to bring this to the societal level. I shouldn't have done that. But communication and then the hyper-awareness, those are kind of new things nowadays that we have to tackle as as coaches and as a, as a group? Well, I think there's, you know, Sherry made a good point about them hiding on the bench. I did this years ago because of that parent problem, you know, like how come Sally's not out there? And I just did it as a, like a social experiment. So I had, you know, a U15 AA team. And I said, if you guys could only pick power play or penalty kill, which one would you pick? Mm. Right. And I had them do it blind because, you know, the girls aren't putting up their hands if they're mm. looking at each other. No way. So they have their heads down. And they put their hand up. Well, based on the paper with my 15 skaters, I only got three kids on the power play. Right. That's an interesting power play. Right. <laughs> and so that's information that, you know, it's just in my pocket. I suggest, you know, if you're coaching girls hockey, it's just an interesting exercise to it do. Is. That's a good point. Because 
they don't necessarily necessarily want to be the one. Now, to me, I go, okay, well, you know, maybe I could have fixed this if I had these kids when they were seven and eight, you know, but at 13, 14, they don't want to be the one. And so when, you know, the papa is mad that they're not out there on the power play, say, well, you know, I did this pretty official <laughs> survey um, and only three of them want to be on the power play. And so we're just doing the best we can. We go, well, it's your job, play. Kim, to make sure they all want to be on the power play. Yeah, yeah but I'm just okay, I'm guessing <laughs> you guys would have to wow. tell me, Mike, like, Lee, if you ask the boys, everyone's on the power play. Everyone. They all play. think they're on the power they play. They all yeah. want right. to be power So there's play. a difference, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's my nice, Sully. That's yeah, a good, yeah. That's it's, a good comeback to my sarcastic dad there. That was good. Yeah, yeah. It's all, um, again, these are just things that are, yeah. are important to know and to communicate. Well, but, I, you know, I say co with the coaches, you've got to be empowered with this kind of information. So if the parents come at you, um, you can say, well, actually, yeah. uh, the girls aren't necessarily wanting to be the leader. And I think that's, you know, like you said earlier, putting them in the positions to succeed, right? To be on the super team where you're the 12th best skater as a girl, I think is a really bad place to be. Yeah. I'd rather see that girl stay at her home center and be the one. Cause there's right. a lot of interesting thing that happens when you're in the top three or four players on your team. And I just think for women, you know, in empowerment, I think that's a really powerful position to be in and to get that experience, I think is huge for your whole right. life, as opposed to go into the super team and like, you know you're you're just another person right and you know if you play college hockey you'll become that other person one day and you'll know what it means to not be the one anymore um but i do <laughs> think it's very empowering for younger girls to stay in a situation where they can be the lead dog um and have to rise to the occasion i think that's an important well, thing I, I was going to say kim our statistics show that you actually were that one player in college uh, as a leading goal screen. i'm just i'm just teasing you know yeah she's nodding for those of you listening uh joking aside uh, you're a great teammate you're a great leader uh and a great player you know another another thing i, I do a lot of work in team dynamics and team building and team uh, mental fitness as mike said you know one of the things i've noticed and i was educated on this by by a prominent female coach um is the difference between healthy competition and collaborative competition um in men and women's sport where and this is not this is not a black and white situation it's not true of every athlete but that that a healthy comp competition excuse me, healthy competition in men's sports in terms of putting one kid against the other kid over and over again boys thrive in that environment where we find women or young girls do not um, you want a collaborative competition where it's, hey, you two are working together to solve this goal. We found that to be far more efficient of a training method than pitting them against each other. I wanted to throw that out there and just kind of put it up for discussion because I, I, I it, th look, there are some scenarios you do have to go one on one. You do have to understand how to battle or hunt, as you said, Kim. But I found that from a training standpoint with with young girls, creating a collaborative competition was very beneficial. Well, they're there because they want to be part of a team. Like I always say, if you wanted to be in an individual sport, like take up golf, this is not <laughs> the place for you. Or and the girls yeah. <laughs> really do thrive in that environment. They want that. They want to see their teammates succeed. Uh, they want to work together with them. I mean, I'm always just so impressed. You know, like I'll be on the bench and there'll be like a kid who's kind of the slowest one or the one who's doing the wrong stuff. And, you know, me and my super competitive head is like, eh. And I'm like, oh, I hope no one else is like thinking the same thing about Sally. And they're all like, yeah, Sally, you did great. Like I, they're just defeating me at every <laughs> every turn. Um, I, I'm expecting the worst, but they just, they want to do it as a group. Um, and that's where I, what I meant earlier, right? Is that you can have a lot of success uh, on the ice by exploiting that want to do it all together. Um, and I, that's a bit of the challenge of coaching is how do you, keep the creativity in, keep that problem solving in without going too much to pass it here, do this, do this, do this, and giving them the answer. So it's right. it's having them work together to find the answer and having them fill the bucket as opposed to us as coaches saying, here are all the answers, do it this way, Great right? And, and that just takes longer and it requires us to be patient, which is the P word. I am definitely not patient, <laughs> but I am trying to learn patience to say, I need you to make all these mistakes. I need you guys to figure this out on your own so that we can have that conversation. Hey, did you see how that worked? What did you do there? 
You know, why did we do it this way? And make them a part of the process. And I find the girls just thrive with that kind of questioning environment versus they will do it the way you fill the cup and tell them to do it. Um, but then as they move up in different levels or they want that college scholarship or they want to play in the PW or on the Olympic team, those players are creative. Yeah, yeah. you they'll stand in the right place in D-zone coverage. No problem. That takes them about three minutes to figure out, right? But how the heck do you stop Natalie Spooner or how the hell do you get around Renata fast? There's no formula for that, guys, right? That's creativity. And so that's, I think, you know, a little bit of that problem solving is – how are we going to solve it without giving them the answer, right. but being patient enough as coaches and parents to say, you're going to screw this up a lot of times till you find the answer for that one moment on the ice that will never happen again. And then you're going to need a different answer. Right. Um, but I agree with you. I, I, I just think they're not lone wolves out there. And, and often the players that are a little bit more of that mindset, um, they don't quite last in the girls environment, even if they're phenomenal players. Um, you know, there's sort of this need to come together as a group. And if you're, you know, a little bit too much uh, individually focused, it, that's really hard in the girls game. Those players, yeah. even though they're phenomenal, they they just stick out like a sore thumb. I don't know, Sherry might have a different experience of that, but I think that's, um, those are the challenging ones when they don't quite buy into the whole team concept. I'll say this, that, that, uh, that old line from the hangover, the one man wolf pack. That's a pretty good way to describe boys hockey. Whereas I, I, <laughs> I think uh, girls hockey is more of just a wolf pack in general. Right. But Kim, you're saying, and I just want to reiterate uh, the importance of what you said about coaching creativity. This is across the board. It's not just hockey. We got to teach our kids to think period. <laughs> like the, those, those critical thinking skills. And I think a lot of, I'll just say adults, like, you want to give them the answer because you care about them. You want them to know. But the truth is you have to let them discover the answer uh, a lot of the times. Again, this is not limited to hockey, right? Um, you got to teach them to think. And, and as Kim said, that coaching the creativity, right? Creativity is a huge part of the game. It's a huge separator in the game amongst the the great players and the players who just go do, do what they're told. Um, we are going here. This has been a great episode so far. I, I think this is a, a, a great place to end unless anybody has any of the uh, questions they want to ask because, Kim, you've just provided so much insight. I was saying while I was sitting here in my own head, like all the hockey dads are just nodding their head right now with all the information you're dropping. And I am definitely going to tell my daughter to hunt for the puck because um, she is very much a stay-at-home, protect-the-net <laughs> defenseman and does not really jump – and we've been trying to figure out a way as coaches to kind of help her understand that. I think you dropped that, right? Is go hunting for the puck. So I, I'm going to give a try and, and I'll, I'll report back in a part two episode with you. But uh, does anybody else have any other questions before before I close this out? No, this is great. Thank you for being here, Kim. No, we didn't even get the team. We didn't even get the team Iceland. So I guess we have to oh, have a yeah. back. Well, we're going to have to do part two. Part two, yeah. part three. You know, this I've is... been traveling all over the world, coaching Team Iceland, super fun. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm happy to come and talk. As you guys can tell, I love it. And I appreciate uh, all the insights and for putting up for it with a Torontonian for an hour talking <laughs> hockey. It's, it's, a it's a lot. This is like the end of a Marvel film. It's like Coach Kim will return. We'll, we'll do one of those like that. Whenever you'll have me, I'm, I'm happy to chat. So you, know, you no. guys just let me know. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, like I said, I I love to share. And so if people want to uh, reach out, email, whether you're coaching boys or girls anywhere in the world, um, this is what I love to do. So I'm happy to help any way I can. Well, look, your pride and passion for the game are clearly pouring through in this episode. Uh, we love guests that love to talk. It makes the podcast much easier. I'm not going to lie to you. So whether you're listening to this or watching this uh kim you have been a fantastic guest and we've shed a lot of light on a lot of topics today the goal of these episodes all of our episodes uh, across the border to learn and to to educate and have a great conversation because we think that from great conversations is where the education comes and that's what we need to do more as a as a hockey society so um as as sherry and mike said thank you so much for being here today 
My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Have a great hockey season. It's just around the corner. Yeah, it's only 12 more months to go, as I like to say. So that's going to do it for the this edition of Our Girls Play Hockey. Remember, you can listen to all of the Our Girls Play Hockey or Our Kids Play Hockey or the Ride to the Rink or Our Kids Play Goalie on the Our Kids Play Hockey Network at ourkidsplayhockey.com. Did I say Our Kids Play Hockey enough in that outro? I think I did. I want to thank all of you for listening today. Again, if you have any questions, you can email us, team at, you guessed it, ourkidsplayhockey.com. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much. And as we always say here, skate on. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.